Okay, good afternoon, everybody. My name is Ken. I'm here with Lingso, and we've got another Master Gardener class, and this is a part two vermicomposting, and Nancy, or Kelly, Nancy and Kelly are back for the second parter. So uh, without further ado, I'll turn the floor over to them. Welcome. Great, thanks so much, Can. Hello, everyone, and welcome to our vermicomposting troubleshooting workshop. Thank you to Can and to Lingso Garden Materials for hosting us today. Just to make sure you know what to expect, this workshop is for people who already have experience composting with worms and who have questions. As we noted in the workshop description, if you are new to vermicomposting, you are certainly welcome here and you're welcome to listen in and learn, but this is not a basic how-to class. If you happen to have worms in your backyard compost piles, that's great and a sign of success, but you're not necessarily vermicomposting. We did a backyard compost troubleshooting workshop back in August, and the recording is available on the Lingso Garden Materials website on the community resources page. We'll drop the link in chat. If you are interested, there are two other classes that Kelly and I are teaching. On Tuesday, October 25th from 6 to 8 p.m., we are teaching a composting class on Zoom for the San Mateo County Office of Sustainability. Um, and that is for those people who live or work in San Mateo County. It includes a section at the beginning on worm composting. And on Saturday, November 12th from 10 a.m. to 12 p.m., we will be teaching a basic composting class in person um, which also includes worm composting at the Master Gardener Education Center at the San Mateo County Event Center. We will have everyone muted during this class to avoid extraneous noise. This presentation is being recorded, so it is up to you whether you would like your video to be on or off. If you have questions, please go to chat and send a direct message to ask questions here and Can will ask them during the Q&A. Now we would like to introduce ourselves. Hi everyone, uh, my name is Kelly Torikai and Nancy and I have been Master Gardeners since 2018. Um, I've also been a San Mateo County Master Composter since 2008 and actually met Nancy through that program. Uh, we now teach composting classes together for the county, as we just mentioned, um, and we enjoy sharing kind of the wonders of compost and the great benefits it has for healthy soil. Uh, we do a lot of experimenting with different types of methods and systems. And at home, I have several different types of worm bins and a couple of cold backyard piles. And my name is Nancy Kruberg. And as you just heard, I am both a master gardener and a master composter in San Mateo County. I enjoy learning about soil and compost by attending conferences and classes talking to other composters, and of course, composting and gardening myself. Also, I studied with Dr. Elaine Ingham for about seven years, learning about soil life and her methods of composting. At home, I compost using hot piles, cold piles, and a few worm bins. So now, we would like to get to know you by having you answer to poll questions. Here is question number one. Um, the question is, how long have you been vermicomposting? So please click on the answer that best describes you and then click that submit button, please. Oh, great, people are on this, I love it. People are getting very used to polls. Good, we're halfway there with participants. Can we get more? That would be lovely. Okay, we'll, we'll end in just a few seconds. Okay, and here we go. So, okay, so there are um, some people here who have never composted before, so vermicomposted, so welcome. 
And uh, let's see, a couple of people who tried but stopped. I'm super happy you guys are here. We hope you to get you recharged. Um, and then there are people with lots of experience, one to five years and one more than five years. Excellent. Thank you so much. And just so you know, um, you can click the little uh, red circle or the X at the top of the poll box and that will get rid of it on the screen for you. Okay, so let's move on. Um, our next poll question is actually going to be on what type of worm bin you have. So we thought we would review the different types of bins that are out there um, with the thought that those of you who have been um, composting, you know, sometimes it's kind of fun to change up systems. So you might, you know, kind of get another idea of something else you might like to try or just uh, for those who are curious about what's out there. All right, so the multi-chamber bin has two or more stacked levels or trays. The two on the left show retail products and the bin on the right is one you can make yourself from storage totes. A single chamber bin is simply one container with ventilation holes. It's very simple. There are also in-ground systems that can uh, be placed directly in a garden or in a raised bed. And these are often called worm towers. And the last style of bin is the continuous flow through system where you add food at the top um, as well as the bedding, of course, and then you harvest the vermicompost from the bottom. So now here's poll number two, what kind of bin do you use? And you're certainly welcome to, to do more than one type if you compost with more than one type of worm bin. So go ahead and answer that and remember to click submit when you finish. Okay, can we get one or two of you more to answer? Well, I guess some people it's, it's hard to answer, but we do have the I don't vermicompost yet. Okay, I think we can probably stop the poll. Excellent, thank you so much. Okay, so it looks like, which I'm not surprised that most people do uh, use the multi-chamber bin. That's what's, you know, counties give them, give them away or give them away, uh, not give them away or discount them. Um, so that is a very popular one. And it looks like, oh my gosh, that's so great. Some of you do single chambered, some have continuous flow and we have some with in-ground. So there's a lot of experience around here. And some one person does other, it'd be curious to know what that is. Okay, again, if you um, want to get that poll off your screen, then click the uh, X or the red circle at the top. All right, now I am going to turn you Oh, no, I'm not yet, sorry. Now we're gonna go in the outline of what we're gonna to do today. Um, first, we're going to uh, be reviewing vermicomposting concepts and Kelly will be in charge of that. Um, and then we're gonna go over the questions that were submitted prior to this class. Then we'll take a five minute break just for a stretch and to give you time to maybe answer or put those questions in chat that you haven't put in. And then when we come back, we'll answer questions from chat. Now. Kelly, there you go. <laughs> Great. Thank you, Nancy. So, you know, we're just going to start off with this little overview. So we're all on the same page before we go into answering your questions. And, you know, vermicomposting is just using worms to recycle organic material into a nutrient rich soil amendment called vermicompost. So in a vermicomposting system, in addition to worms, of course, you're growing microbes and all the other critters that produce vermicompost, so you want a habitat that suits them. And, you know, after you've spent the time and energy to make vermicompost, when you then put it on your soil, you're providing all these nutrients, organic matter, and beneficial microbes that cycle nutrients right in the root zone of your plants. Um, and also vermicompost, like other types of compost, also helps to improve soil structure. So it's a great thing. <laughs> so how do you foster kind of that habitat for all these helpful organisms in a worm bin? Well, when we talk about composting in general, there's the big four, of browns, greens, air, and water. Now, the big four are some of the main things that you want to think about when you're troubleshooting composting issues, including in a worm bin. 
So browns are the materials that have more carbon in them. In a worm bin, browns are mainly the bedding, and some examples are, you know, paper, usually shredded, as shown in this graphic, um, coconut core, corrugated cardboard, egg cartons, and leaves that have died and then fallen off of trees. Greens are the materials that have more nitrogen in them. In a worm bin, greens are what you feed the worms, like food scraps, plant trimmings, and coffee grounds. Air is necessary uh, to have available and circulating in the bin because worms are aerobic creatures and need air to thrive. And then you'll need water in the sense that worms need a moist environment to live in. Uh, worms do best at around 60 to 70 percent moisture, which is like a lightly wrung out sponge. So when you're setting up a bin or a tray with new bedding, when you squeeze that bedding tightly, you should get about three to five drops of moisture that come out. And uh, now in figuring out how to balance all of these factors, it can be helpful to understand the worm's habitat and biology to kind of bring these concepts together. So um, let's just kind of think about the habitat of a composting worm. Out in the natural world, the type of worms used for composting live where there's moist soil and dead plant material. They live in the leaf litter or the organic material that sits on top of the mineral soil. And this environment is dark and moist, but also has a lot of air pockets for airflow through it. Um, earthworms actually have no noses or eyes. Um, they breathe and sense light and vibrations through their skin, which they need to keep moist. Um, and, and they do avoid light to avoid drying out. So since they breathe through their skin, that airflow is important. And it's why worms like a uh, fluffy, uh, for lack of a better way to describe it, <laughs> but moist environment. Uh, with temperature, uh, worms thrive in a range of around 55 to 75 degrees Fahrenheit. Uh, they can survive outside of this range, but just for shorter times, the further it gets from that range. Uh, something to remember here is that bedding can really help to provide insulation. So if it's too hot or too cold outside, if you have a good amount of bedding in your bin, worms can actually move toward the middle where it's going to be more temperate. And uh, the population of worms in a bin depends on a combination of factors like temperature, the amount of food that's available, uh, and the amount of bedding in the bin, which gives them space to live in. Um, and a really interesting fact is that worms will regulate their population by adjusting their reproduction depending on you know, these different factors. So if conditions in the bin are less than ideal, the population will decrease. But on the other hand, if everything is good for the worms, the population will increase, but you'll never end up with too many worms because they'll only increase their population to the point that the bin will support it. So kind of, you know, wrapping up <laughs> what we talked about there, um, here are some keys to successful vermicomposting. So first, the location of the bin should be accessible so that it's easy to feed and monitor regularly. Uh, you also want it positioned so that it's ergonomically safe to manage because the bins and trays can get heavy. Um, you want the bin to be protected from the elements, mainly sun and rain, so that it doesn't get too hot or too wet. So you can place it like under a tree or a deck, um, next to the house, under the eaves of the roof, in a shed or a garage, or even inside your house. Uh, bedding is kind of the worm's home, so make sure you give them sufficient room to live in by making sure you have enough of those carbon-rich bedding materials in the bin. Um, you want to keep the bin uh, environment moist, airy, and stocked with an appropriate amount of food. And you want the temperature to be within or close to that range of 55 to 77, which is you know kind of easy to remember because it's close to what would be comfortable for us humans. So remember, again, that we're talking about the temperature inside the bin, which will remain more constant than the outside temperature. 
So, you know, the outside temperature can be colder or hotter, uh, possibly like during the heat wave we just had last month. Uh, during extreme weather like that, though, you may need to check uh, your bin a little more often and possibly add some insulation, moisture, or protection. And we'll address this in more detail soon because we had a really good um, pre-submitted question about this. And then last but not least, uh, you know, just continue to monitor and troubleshoot, which is really something that just becomes kind of a natural part of maintaining your bin. Um, eventually, you know, you won't really notice even that you're doing it. But when we talk about monitoring, we just want to encourage you to use your senses. So as soon as you open the bin, what does it look like? You know, is there enough bedding? Is there an imbalance of insects or other critters? Are worms present in healthy numbers? And are worms trying to escape? And we actually have a question about this, so we'll be going into that a little more later. Also, what do you smell? So healthy worm bins really don't smell, or they may have maybe a faint smell, but nothing that's going to be very pungent. Then use your sense of touch to determine whether the bin is too wet or too dry. And often you can actually see if a bin is too wet or too dry. So once you've made your observations, you know, move on to addressing any potential issues, you know, devise and implement a corrective action plan. And especially if you're relatively new to vermicomposting or if you run into an unusual problem, we suggest kind of recording the problem, the actions you take, and then the outcomes for future reference. So that's our really quick review of vermicomposting concepts. But before we move on to the next section of the workshop, we noticed from the questions we received that a number of you use the multi-chamber bin systems. Um, and that actually came up in the poll also. <laughs> we thought it would be helpful to kind of talk a little bit about how these systems are designed to work. So the photo here shows um, you know, the multi-chamber bin with two trays with holes in the bottom and then one solid tray. So the solid tray indicated by the red arrow catches leachate, which is the fluid that's released from or that leaches out of food as it decomposes. And we will go into a little more detail on leachate soon. So more for that uh, later. Uh, the other two trays, with the holes on the bottom sit above that bottom leachate tray. So when you have a brand new worm bin, you'll start with only one tray with holes in the bottom, and that would be your active or feeding tray that's shown uh, with the green arrow there. And at first you wouldn't have that middle tray with the yellow arrow. Um, when vermicompost builds up, you know, in the active tray, then you can add a new active tray with new bedding on top. That new tray is where you're going to start to add food, and the old active tray becomes the finishing tray in the middle there, shown with the yellow arrow. So you don't add food there, so everything in that tray just continues to decompose into uh, finished vermicompost. When that finishing tray no longer has identifiable materials in it and it looks kind of like black cottage cheese, um, it's time to harvest the vermicompost from that tray, which leaves it empty. So now you can add new bedding to that one and place that tray on the top and that becomes your new active tray. You just keep rotating those trays through this process and that's how the multi-chamber bin is typically designed to work. Thank you, Kelly. And now we're going to go through the questions that we received and prepared before today. And if you have any questions while we're talking about this, or of course, those questions, if you didn't pre-submit them, now is the time to put in chat or do it while we're going through the pre-submitted questions. And remember to put them under ask questions here. Those will go directly to CAN. All right. And Kelly is going to take the first part. Okay, so this is our first pre-submitted question that came in with um, these photos. Um, on the left is a top tray, and on the right is a photo of the middle tray. So this person asked, I would like to add more bedding. How do I do this? Do I need to take all of the castings out and apply new bedding, or can I mix new bedding in with the castings? And then what's a good recipe for new bedding? 
And then about the second, uh, the middle tray, um, I use that tray just for collecting castings. Can I put more bedding in the second tray and add more worms? Have you tried this and can this work? So we actually split this question into two parts. The first part is more related to feeding and maintaining the bin, and the second one we feel is more related to harvesting. So for part one and how to add bedding, while we can see that this bin is successfully producing vermicompost, uh, th this active tray does look like it could use a little more bedding. So we generally recommend keeping maybe two to three inches of bedding. And um, to maintain that, when you add food to the bin, you should also add some dry bedding. Um, if you already have uh, plenty of dry bedding, like you would when you're starting a new tray, then you can just kind of make a hole in the bedding, deposit the food there, and then cover the food back up with the bedding. Um, now, just like in a backyard compost bin, you want to make sure that you have the right balance of browns and greens. So, um, you know, again, the greens in this case are your food scraps and the browns are the bedding you should have about uh, three times as many browns or your carbon rich material than greens and if you want to add bedding to this top tray you can but you don't need to harvest the castings um, you can simply add bedding right on top of this we recommend though that you do not mix the bedding with the castings um, think about mimicking nature here where leaves would just kind of fall on the surface and um, then as far as a recipe for bedding goes, you have many options and a lot of freedom here, actually. Um, you can use things like shredded newspaper, shredded or torn cardboard, crushed dead leaves, or even um, finished backyard compost. Using a variety of these materials is desirable. And for paper products, you know, just avoid any paper or cardboard that has a glossy coating. So this is an example of what bedding can look like in a bin. And here, uh, when I put this together, I just used torn corrugated cardboard, shredded newspaper, some coconut core, and torn up egg cartons. So that's what it can look like. So now for the second part of this question, um, this person has been using that middle tray to collect castings. And as you can see in the photo, there's a lot of extra space here. So thinking back to what we mentioned before about how these bins are typically designed to work, the standard method for, you know, using this middle kind of finishing bin uh, would be to go ahead and harvest the vermicompost and then use that, you know, in the garden, on house plants, or to make a seed starting or potting mix. Or you can even store uh, some of the vermicompost in a ventilated container, like a storage tub that has holes poked in the lid. Once you've removed those castings, then you have, you know, an empty tray that you can use to start the new active tray. So just like when you start a worm bin, you would line that empty tray with several sheets of newspaper or some corrugated cardboard cut to size. Um, then you can fill it with plenty of new bedding, making sure that it's properly moist. Um, you can add a little bit of grit and you can even add a handful of material from the old active tray. Um, then this new active tray goes on top of the old active tray and um, you know the old one turns into the finishing tray so um, with the new tray that you have on top you can now you know add some food and then worms are going to migrate upward or uh, if you want to you can even take some worms uh, from the older tray and add them you know, to the new tray just to get things going. And eventually, you know, the rest of the worms are going to follow. So um, there is another way that we thought we could interpret this question. And if the question is about feeding more than one tray of a multi-chambered bin system, uh, we actually have been asked this question in the past. We have heard of someone actually going ahead and trying this, and it's working. Um, the only thing is it is a little bit of extra work removing that top tray to feed the middle tray all the time. Um, you know, if capacity is kind of an issue, you might consider getting a second worm bin or getting or making a larger worm bin. 
For this person in particular, though, um, remember that that active trade didn't have that much betting in it. So as a first step, we would actually recommend adding more betting to the active tray, which increases the space that the worms have to live in. And as long as all the other conditions are good, having more bedding and space should result in an increase in the worm population, which then allows you to put more food into the bin. So lots of stuff there, but I hope that's helpful. <laughs> Super, thanks Kelly. All right, so we then had a series of questions about worms escaping. So we thought we would talk to you about this in sort of general terms first. The first question to ask is, are they trying to ex escape or just exploring the bin? You will often find worms on the sides and maybe even the top of your bin as you see on the picture on the left. And this is really just exploring and is qu quite normal behavior. Sometimes, however, when it's about to rain or it's actually raining, you will notice more going up the sides and onto the inside of the lid. This seems to be a behavior that you find in nature, such as when you go out in the rain and you see all those worms who have come up from the ground and are crawling along the cement and all. The reasons why vary um, if you look at some of the research. Um, some people say it's the extra moisture, which allows them to travel above ground to find mates or following going above ground to maybe find a new location. Um, and some research, some researchers believe that it may be that they're um, looking for a little more oxygen um, and they're because their, their holes are being flooded, maybe there's more air up um, at the ground level. But if there are many more worms than usual on the sides and lids, it may indicate that something is wrong in the bedding or with your food, and you can look for those problems. If they are truly trying to escape, it may look like the picture on the right, or you'll see worms outside of the bin, and unfortunately, usually in the form of dried remains on the ground, because often if they, they're trying to escape and then there's no moisture, they kind of shrivel up. It's rather sad. So our first question about worms escaping, um, this person thought that his worms were trying to escape because he saw them nestled into these cracks and crevices, and he wondered why that happened. He noticed that this happens regularly just before he's about to feed them, and he feeds them about every 12 to 14 days. He's wondering if they're hungry, if he's not feeding them enough, or if something else could be going on in the bin. To answer the first question um, about why they would bunch up, this situation may be very normal for your particular bin. As we discussed earlier, this may be just normal exploration and it may happen at this time, maybe because there's not interesting food to eat. But if you look at the bin, there actually is food left in there like leaves and the coffee filter, at least I see those. Um, are they hungry? Well, probably not because we see there's some food, um, but if it bothers you to see that kind of behavior, experiment with feeding them a little bit earlier than you normally do and see if that stops that kind of behavior. It's fun to experiment and watch the behavior of your worms. Um, and then could it be something else? Well, only some of the worms are doing this. So again, it may be normal for your bin. Um, maybe those are just their favorite spots. <laughs> Ah, okay. Um, so the next question, and Nancy, I think yes. your slide has not Oops. advanced. Sorry about that. There we go. There we go. Um, okay. So this person has a, a DIY system. Uh, the top tray has many holes in the bottom, so worms can move between the top and the middle trays. The middle tray only has a few holes for drainage into the leachate tray, and this was done so that worms wouldn't readily move down into the leachate tray. In this particular setup, these trays need to stay kind of in that order. So when harvesting, 
the contents from the middle tray are removed and used in the garden. And then the entire contents from the top tray are moved into the middle tray. Um, so this time that the bin was harvested, um, when the contents from that top tray were moved into the middle tray, the bin actually heated up from 60 degrees to 85 degrees. And this picture shows what happened. So uh, what do we think uh, caused the reaction that we see in the photo with all these worms bunched up around the edges? Um, you know, first, we want to compliment this person for having a really healthy worm bin, because if you have this many worms, it really indicates that overall this bin is healthy. Uh, this photo, though, is really interesting, and we hadn't seen anything like this before, so we were really fascinated. Um, Nancy and I love to see everyone's compost. But anyway, <laughs> this was a really interesting photo. Um, so there were a few things that we kind of thought of. Um, first is that, you know, worms don't really like major disturbances. So just by moving them, you know, into another tray, they may have kind of felt maybe it wasn't safe and reacted this way. Um, another cause may have been that quick change in temperature. So, uh, you know, even though worms can handle 85 degrees, this quick a rise in temperature may have kind of stressed them and caused them to move toward the sides that, that may have been cooler. Uh, this person also mentioned that they use leaves as bedding material. And we were wondering if these are actually dead leaves that they're using. If so, that's good. Um, however, if they were green leaves that were dried for storage, they're actually still a green material because um, they are higher in nitrogen. So this may be a case of adding too many greens to the bin, um, you know, along with all those food scraps, which are also greens, which then could cause an increase in temperature. Um, another thing is that, you know, for this many worms, it looks like the bin could use a little more bedding. So in addition to leaves, uh, this person could consider adding shredded newspaper, um, or, you know, cardboard, you know, some of these nice high carbon kind of uh, materials that are just easy to find. And remember again, adding a variety of bedding is good for your worms and could also help to keep the brown to greens ratio kind of in a better balance um, and presents and prevent, excuse me, some of that heating. So, uh, you know, in general, we recommend keeping about a three inch layer of bedding in the worm bin. Then another thing that we would recommend is that you maybe make more holes in the bottom of that middle tray. So the middle and, um, and top trays have the same amount of holes so that when you harvest, you can then just start a new tray and rotate their positions rather than emptying the contents, you know, from one tray to another. Thanks, Kelly. Now, this question was about worms in that really bad heat wave we had last month. Um, and these worms clearly did not look happy. And it was suspected that the worms were looking for someplace cool. And there was a lot of food left in the bin. The worm bin was in the shade as they were under a tarp and moving the worms indoors was not an option for this worm owner, worm bin owner. <laughs> this person wondered if ice cubes should be added, but there was concern that the bin would get too wet as, as he felt it was already a bit on the wet side. So what should be done? We agree that they those worms do not look happy. Generally, if things are going well in the bin and you have a heat wave such as we did, the worms will try to get into the cooler middle when it's really hot rather than escaping out as you see here. So there may have been some inhospitable conditions starting to occur which would make those worms want to escape. If you notice the worms escaping like this during heat, first stop feeding them. In hot weather, uh, worms may slow down or stop eating just as a normal um, course of action. <laughs> um, and at that point, you would absolutely start feeding less. Uh, the food itself 
can create heat as it's decomposing, which adds to the excessive heat um, problem. As the food decomposes, it also creates moisture. If the bin is already on the wet side, this may cause the bin to become too wet and will decrease the amount of air in the bin. The worms will not want to stay under those anaerobic conditions because they like air. In this picture, it appears that there is food on top. So we recommend that first of all, the food um, would be covered with more bedding. Are you kind of getting a theme here? <laughs> Bedding's <laughs> important. Um, and when you add bedding, um, it can absorb some of that excess moisture and will help insulate the bin from the heat, as Kelly mentioned in the review. Uh, you mentioned that your bin is in the shade because it is covered with a tarp and we can't see that system. If the tarp's like almost directly on top, it may actually be trapping in hot air. Um, and if that is the case, what we'd recommend that you create some kind of a frame that's a bit off your bin, put the tarp over and then create a little more airflow that might help. Um, you had a great idea about using ice, but if, as you said, if your bin is already on the wet side, of course, you don't want to do that. But you could try taking, you know, one of the, I hate using plastic, but the plastic water bottles and freeze them and then put them in. And that way you're not, the water won't be coming in your bin, but the coolness will. Or you can put ice cubes in some other container that won't get the, the wet from the water into the bin. Okay, huh. Kelly, this yep, is you. Back to me. Yep. Um, <laughs> so this next question is about harvesting and it reads, um, I'm relatively new to vermicomposting and I'm wondering how to approach harvesting. I've had a three tier can of worms for about a year. I've seen a few videos online about a coning method, but I'm still stuck on logistics. For example, do I just dump the whole tray out onto a tarp and start harvesting? Lastly, do I have to sift the compost? Uh, so the harvesting method that you're referring to is kind of the dump and sort method. <laughs> and the answer to the first part of your question is yes, you can certainly dump the whole tray onto a tarp, or you can just take smaller amounts at, at a time and use something like a cafeteria tray <laughs> that's shown in these photos. So you take the vermicompost out and you form them into cones or little volcanoes and any worms that are exposed will naturally move toward the center of the piles, you know, since they don't like light. So the top left photo shows piles of vermicompost where I'm using an old spoon to just scrape off the outer layers of vermicompost. Um, next, in the top right, it shows a partially separated pile with an exposed worm. The lower left shows the harvest and vermicompost around the edges with two small piles of worms covered by thin layers of vermicompost. And the lower right shows what the little pile of worm looks like if you open them up a bit. So once you get down to the little ball of worms, um, you know, that remain, you can take them and put them back in your bin. And then you can go and use the rest of that harvested vermicompost. So if you have a multi-chamber bin, like the can of worms, here's an alternate method that we learned from a fellow master gardener and master composter. So, you know, just as a reminder, if you're looking at the system here, the middle is the finishing tray that has the finished vermicompost that you wanna harvest. So with this alternate method, um, you take the lid off the bin and you swap the positions of the active and finishing trays so that that finishing tray is on the top. You expose it to light and then any of the exposed worms are gonna move downward away from that light. You can remove thin layers of vermicompost off the top with like a spoon or a spade and you know set that harvested vermicompost to the side um, or in a separate container and just repeat that process till you reach the bottom of the tray and you know all or most <laughs> of the worms will have moved kind of down into that active feeding tray so now you have lots of harvested vermicompost and an empty tray that you can then just line and put new bedding in and it'll become your new active tray so um, you know if you try this process 
let us know how you like it. Um, this is this is this has become the way that I harvest vermicompost now because it's really easy to be able to kind of do it all in place. Ah, and then the last part of this question um, is about sifting. So with vermicompost, you generally do not need to sift it as you might with you know your typical backyard compost. Uh, vermicompost is already pretty fine in texture and any larger pieces of material can just you know kind of be picked out um, by hand or with a fork or some other utensil if you don't want to touch it. Um, and then you can just put those chunky pieces back into your bin. All right, thanks Kelly. Yep. And now we um, have had several questions about leachate um, mostly about using it and is it okay for worms to be in trays? So I'm going to kind of lump all of them into this one uh, slide here. So this photo shows some leachate in the bottom of the multi-chamber bin. And leachate is the fluid that gets released from or leaches out of the food as it decomposes. But it can also has that liquid is filtering through some of the finished compost, it can also have some enzymes and maybe some nutrients in there. Uh, you may hear this referred to as worm tea, worm juice, worm pea, but leachate is the accurate term. And just an aside, worms do not pee. So your goal should have to be to have little or no leachate. And adding dry bedding when you add food helps with that by absorbing excess moisture. Um, you may get some leachate though if there's food with very high moisture, such as think about putting a watermelon in there, which if any of you've done that, you know how much the worms love that. Um, anyway, it will, um, it will be a lot of liquid. And if you put dry bedding with that, it'll help absorb some of that. Um, but, and again, if you get some leachate, that is just fine. There's nothing wrong with it. Just, you know, try not to have your bins too wet. Um, and using leachate itself is controversial. And since uh, we as master gardeners represent the University of California, we need to take an approach with health and safety in mind. So if you open up the leachate tray and it has a ver very foul odor, that means it's gone anaerobic and it could contain some harmful microbes or pathogens. So the safest option is just to dispose of it and not use it on your plants. Um, if the leachate doesn't smell, well, you can certainly dilute it. And we recommend one part leachate, to, so maybe like three or four parts water, and use it on your well-established plants, um, such as your ornamentals or trees. Uh, leachate should not be used directly on the edible parts of your plant. And is it okay for worms to actually be in this tray? Because if you've ever had a leachate tray with some liquid, you know some of them love to hang out down there. So the answer is yes, it is okay. Some worms just seem to prefer that environment. We're not sure why, but they do. Um, so if, if they are there, it is okay to leave them. But again, it's your choice how you manage your bins. So if you're uncomfortable with having your worms down in that tray, you can lift them up carefully and put them into the more active tray. Um, and I think that's it. So let's move on. Um, so you will be getting this slide set after today's class. So you'll have this on here, but we just wanted to show you, we do have some references for you to look up and learn more about um, vermicomposting and the benefits that it has for your garden. Um, we also have some books here that um, you might like. Worms Eat My Garbage by Mary Abelhoff is the classic. She passed away several years ago, but it is still a classic book for home comp vermicomposters. Um, it's a fun read. So if you don't have a copy of that and you're, you're vermicomposting, you should probably put your hands on it or go to the library and read it. Um, the next one, The Worm Farmer's Handbook, is really for mid to large scale, but Kelly and I have found that it has some really, really good information. So if you really like to dig deeper into a subject, it's a fun book to have. You might look at that. And then the other two have to do with microbes, which we love. And microbes are such a big part of composting and soils. And those books just teach you um, at a very easy level about what goes on and, and what those microbes do. Um, 
and we're not finishing yet, but we'll, we'll do that here because we've got the slides. We wanted to again thank Lingso Garden Materials and for um, people who helped us prepare this. So Kelly and I did this uh, slide set, but we also had some help from Karen Flores, Howard Hibbs, and Chelsea Taylor, who were newly minted master gardeners, and it was super fun to have them working alongside of us. Um, and again, if you want to subscribe to our newsletter, there's a link here. So when you get the slide, you can click on that. If you, if you don't get our newsletter, you can get it here. And of course, donations are always welcome. And if you have questions after today, you can go to our helplines. There's email, there's phone, and these are the hours when uh, the, the helplines happen. So please take advantage of that. Okay, thank you so much to those people who did your pre-submitted questions. It was super fun preparing that. So we're gonna take a five minute break now. And during that time, please stretch your legs. Um, or if you have a question and you haven't had time to type it in, please, now is the time to put it in um, into chat so that we will get your questions. And when we come back from our break, we will answer your questions. And it's a, about a quarter of now, so at 10 minutes till two, we will come back on and start answering your questions. Thanks.
Okay, should we get started? All righty, okay. So um, some of these questions I think you've already answered in the um, in your talk, but I'll go ahead and ask them anyway, so it'd be a refresher. Um, so this person's asking, does it make a difference that I'm in South Florida? Mm. Oh, <laughs> that's so exciting. Welcome. We're so happy you're here. I know vermicomposting should be the same no matter where you're doing it. It's just you're going to have different weather and, you know, protect your worms accordingly. Kelly, do you have anything to add to that? That's that's what I would say. Yeah, I think it should be pretty similar. You know, it's just potentially working with a little bit of the temperature extremes, maybe. Um, but hopefully we gave, you know, some good hints on how to deal with hot weather. Uh, if yeah. not, please, you know, please let us know any more specific uh, questions. Yeah, no, that's true. And and just just think about the, the basics of um, Kel Kelly did that beautiful slide about like, what do worms need? Where is their natural habitat? And if you just think it, keep that in your mind and think like a worm, <laughs> you'll do well. <laughs> Okay, um, so this person wants to know when is it the right time to put the vermicomposting bin outside? They currently have a bin inside. Um, and when is it okay to put it outside? Kelly, you want to jump in on that or you I know, can if you want? I would say that if you're okay with having your bin inside, you know, leave it there. Um, the more um i guess the more protected your your worm bin is i think the easier it is to to manage so that's that's what i would say um if you really want to move it outside you know maybe just move it outside during kind of more temperate times of the year perfect <laughs> couldn't have said it better <laughs> all righty so next question is um if you were to line the top tray with paper and put in the bedding on the top new top tray, how do the worms migrate up before the paper decomposes? Oh, Kelly, so I'm going to answer this because I used to just kind of skip that step because I thought <laughs> the same thing. They're never going to get up. And Kelly convinced me to do otherwise. And she's right. They make their way through. Um, I don't know how they do it. I think it's just little nooks and crevices because I actually, uh, sometimes it's newspaper, but sometimes I have cardboard and I'll re-put cardboard down and they manage to get up. Um, so try it because Kelly convinced <laughs> me that it would really would work and it does. <laughs> it does. You know, the, the worm bin is moist. The, the, you know, newspaper or cardboard moistens up and it gets a little bit soft and those worms, they find a way, you know, they find a way around whatever barrier and get yeah. in there. <laughs> All righty. Okay, so next question is, this person um, have used a biostack system for about 20 years and everything has gone well until recently. And based on what you had said earlier, they think that the intense heat greatly reduced their reproduction and they still have few babies. However, they're wondering if they should purchase new worms since the worms have left and are not eating the produce. I think that's a personal choice. Um, to me, like I, I'm pretty sure I lost some of my worms during the heat as well. Although I thought I had lost a ton and I was bemoaning the fact that I didn't care for them well enough. They were just hunkered down because all of a sudden when the weather cooled down, they were more than I thought. But I personally am just waiting for them to repopulate themselves. But if you're in a hurry and you want, you know, it, maybe you do, maybe you might, you might have more food scraps than I have at my house. And, and if you really want to do it, you know, there's no harm in buying more to add. I think it's a personal choice. Yeah, I think everyone's worm bins had a tough <laughs> time in the heat. Oh my goodness. Yeah, but you'll be surprised because they're pretty resilient and they do find places to hide. Yeah. You know? They're yeah. able to get around newspaper and cardboard, and they're also <laughs> able to, you know, take shelter from, from adverse conditions. <laughs> okay. All right. So the next question is, how long would you expect 
um, it to take from starting a warm bin to harvesting your first batch of casting? So first thing I'm going to say is I think it depends on the time of year. So um, Kelly talked at length about the ideal temperature range for them. So in the winter, we get to the low side of that. In the summer, as we just proved, we can get way to the other side of that. And both sides of those temperature extremes, uh, worms don't eat as much. They're much less active and you can't put as much food in the bin. Um, so I would say on average, it's going to be like four to six months. Some people can get it as soon as three, but I'm guessing they're doing it, you know, like probably early summer where it's warm enough and they're active and all that. But I think four to six months is, is a good expectation. It'll be a little quicker if it's like spring, summer, early fall, and it'll be slower if it's like intense heat of summer or during the winter months. It can also depend a little bit on how many worms you start out with, um, you know, because some people Very will just good, start yeah. out with a pound of worms, some people will start out with two. Um, I actually started a worm bin out with probably a quarter pound of worms. Um, and that is what has, you know, populated all of my bins for as long as I've had them now. Uh, they really, if you give them good conditions, they can reproduce pretty quickly and uh, really, you know, fill up a bin. So, so yeah, I think it also depends on maybe how many worms you're starting out with too. Yep. <laughs> okay, great. Um, how good do you think the bags of worm castings are that you buy commercially? You know, I think it varies. I, I think it really, the quality re can really vary because um, I, I know there are we have some friends at Linkso, as a matter of fact, um, who, who purchased a who purchased a bag of you know high quality vermicompost and they were kind of afraid because they left it out you know in 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 their patio or something for several months and i mean it what it was stored well so you know the bag was ventilated the um they, they kept it you know shaded it wasn't sitting out in the sun you know baking um, and when they opened that bag when they finally used it they found all kinds of worms in it so um, so I think that you can have very good quality uh, vermicompost sold in bags, um, and I'm sure you can have kind of low quality um, vermicompost too from, you know, if, if if they haven't been stored quite as well, if they're not, you know, uh, produced and packaged quite as well. So I think the quality can really vary. So, you know, read up on the source. Um, take a look at the packaging packaging should be ventilated you know there should be at least small holes in the packaging um, which is also how we advise you to if you're going to make vermicompost and if you're going to store it make sure you have holes in your container <laughs> um, and and yet yeah, try to make sure that those you know anything that you purchase has been stored well um, yeah, I don't know, Nancy, anything to add? I, you did great. I was about to say, tell them about the ventilation holes, Kelly, and you got my vibe, so you said it. <laughs> um, and, and I also, you know, I, I, I'm all for, you know, compost and vermicompost being a little on the moist side. If it's, you open it up and it's powder, you know, it's not, it's just not going to be as good. Um, but yes, I agree with everything you said. And one thing I'll add on as well is the food source. So often these like mm -hmm. commercial worm far farms, you have to be careful as to what the worm is eating or is being fed as well. Um, so obviously that food source will dictate how nutrient dense that casting will be. So that's always a good one to kind of watch out for. And it's a good reason to, you know, make your own vermicompost. You yeah, know exactly you what's going to go absolutely. in yeah. <laughs> and how it's, you know, yeah. how it's are produced, just, how it's stored, yeah. are they how just fresh it is. Paper and cardboard, are they eating <laughs> food scraps? <laughs> so that, yeah, absolutely. So the food source is, is important. Um, so the next question is, what is the best way to use the finished vermicompost? Uh, should I make compost extract? and use this li liquid on my plants, or can I use it on my edibles? Might I get sick from it? How long might I need to wait before I can eat it? Wow, all yeah. really good questions. So first of all, <laughs> extract is my favorite way to use it. <laughs> but I also, um, 
so yes, turning it liquid because it, it helps the product go farther. Um, and you don't, yeah, because it you don't get a ton of worm casting. Well, unless you have a huge system, but from our most of our home bins, you don't get a, a, a lot. But it's really dense and it's really packed with nutrients more so than your backyard compost. Um, so extract's great, but I also I love using it in um, seed starting or or a potting soil mix. Um, I just think it gives a nice boost. And in there, of course, I use the the solid. Um, and I never worry about putting in a on a you know a plant as long as again if it smells good it should be fine um, because whatever goes through the gut of the worm is generally pretty darn healthy. But I mean, I, I don't think I would um, pour it on lettuce and then harvest the lettuce and eat it. I would, you know, I would uh, rinse it off, but I don't know. So I don't know if there's any research on if you have to wait. Um, so I, I think so. there are some like the CDFA, the California mm -hmm. farms and or yeah. Department food, food and food and thank yeah. you <laughs> <laughs> thank you um cdfa yes um they actually do have regulations for compost use that you know are based right. on um you know fairly conservative safety standards and i think it's something like if you're applying compost you have to wait i don't know something like 30 or 60 days to harvest or or something like that um yeah, so I, I couldn't. I can spat off the numbers, but you can go look it up. Yeah, you can um, go look it up. Um, so that would be, you know, some safety standard out there that you could um, that you could use. You know, if that's helpful. Okay, and how um, how long can you store or can you store finished castings and use it later? Um, this person would like to use it in the spring, and they're wondering if they could do that. I don't see anything wrong with it. I mean, you know, I like to use mine right away, but there are times when I have a bunch and like, I don't have a place for it. So as long as you have it someplace where it can stay moist and, and it's got plenty of air, it'll be, it, it, I, I don't know if I can put a number on it, but I would think it would last till spring. No problem. As long as you're paying attention to it, if you, you know, put it in an open bucket and leave it out and it all dries out by, then you'll have dust by, um, by spring and it won't be so great but if you you know you kind of cover it a little bit and every now and a while look at it maybe spritz it with a little bit of water um yeah kelly what do you think um i think that yes definitely make sure to keep it moist and ventilated um, you want it ventilated because you know it's already pretty moist and you don't want to take air away from it so that it would turn anaerobic that's definitely uh not good thing um and then, yeah, keeping it moist is key because, you know, vermicompost is so fine that if it dries out, it kind of turns into like hard rocks <laughs> and then you can't use it. And it's just, it's kind of sad. <laughs> so yeah, just be careful. Just monitor store. it, just monitor yeah. it. Yeah, just don't, don't check just, on it every now and then. Yeah, don't just put, I mean, even if you think you've set it up right, don't forget about it. Like, yeah, keep checking on it. Alrighty. Uh, so the next question is about adding a lot of bedding, um, which will make the system uh, more dry. And they're wondering if they should add water to this. Um, and if so, they're also concerned about having too much leachate. Okay, so I'm going to uh, say something about Go the bedding. <laughs> so if you if you're putting in like really wet foods, and you want to add dry bedding, again, it'll just absorb the moisture so that your bin doesn't get overly wet and then become anaerobic because you've, you know, there's no way for water to get around it. However, if you're noticing that your bins um, are are getting dry well then you might want to wet up like just like what you do with a new tray or a new bin you wet up your bedding first and and then let the worms in um, so if you're if your system's getting dry yes you might want to wet up your cardboard and all that before putting it in so i think again it's it's monitoring for the right moisture and adjusting accordingly and a good thing to do is to kind of if you are um if you if you do keep your bin in kind of a dry 
area, um, or you get a lot of, you know, ventilation, a lot of wind going through there that might, you know, kind of take some of the moisture out of your bin, um, you know, keep a spray bottle with water in it nearby so that when you're, you know, when you're going to feed, if the bedding looks dry, then you can kind of spritz it a little bit and add some moisture. So That's excellent. I, yeah, because I, I do have a bin that I keep outside that is quite well ventilated um, that I do need to actually spray, um, you know, the the bedding down every now and then, whereas I never need to do that to the, for the warm bins in the garage. Yeah, and I have the same situation. I have, um, a, you know, one of those multi um, chambered bins that's plastic and, and all that, and, and I rarely have to add extra moisture to that one but I also but I have a flow through that has fabric where it gets just so much more air and it's constantly getting um, drier on the top and so yes I do the same thing as Kelly I have a little spritzer bottle so every now and then I just give it a little squirt and everything's good all righty um Okay, have you heard about the sub pod system and do you have any feelings about that? I have friends in Australia who use one and they love it. Um, I haven't used it myself, but to me it's, it's very, it's like a warm tower. So if you like the idea of having it going into your garden bed, I say go for it, try it. I, lo I love that people try different things. So try it and let us know how it goes. And if you want to make your own sub pot, just take a container, drill a bunch of holes, and sink it into your garden bed. <laughs> Easy to try if you want. Indeed. Okay. Um, can folks use regular tap water? I know most of the city water has chloramines and chlorines in it. And won't this kill the microbes? And aren't microbes important? What are your thoughts on that? Great question. So um, if you want to just use regular tap water, you will be absolutely fine. Um, unless, I mean, if you live like really close to a treatment plant, maybe the chlorine and chloramine may be stronger because it gets a little weaker the farther you get away from it. Um, but uh, think about um, once the system gets going, particularly, um, there is a lot of like humic substances and things in there which will actually neutralize all that so it should be okay in the end um, if you want to though you could certainly um, you know get a filter on your hose or or um, you know get get water where you dechlorinate it first um, it depends how how much you want to monitor and um, protect your microbes because yes it does you're right, it does kill microbes, but in this system, I think you'll be okay without it. But if you care enough that you really want to do that extra mile to make sure that every microbe survives, those are some ways that you can um, can help them out. Yeah, so I, I will totally admit to always using tap water <laughs> and it's not been a problem. You know, starting new trays, um, you know, spritzing, uh, I, I really don't feel like I've had a problem with my, yeah. my and poor I little used, micro population. Yeah. Well, and I used to do that. I actually just, I, I went ahead and put a filter on my hose and I just like it for all my composting. I do do it. I run it through a filter, but you know, to each his own and it does work without a filter. So. <laughs> okay. Fabulous. So here's the last question for you. Um, can you add earthworms from the ground? earth um, into your worm bins along with the red wrigglers? Um, I'd say you can if you want to, but I, from my understanding, they are not as efficient. Plus, if you think about those earthworms that you're getting from your garden, they actually like to be in the mineral parts of the soil. And when you're putting them in a worm bin, you're taking them out of that natural habitat. And it's different when you have a backyard bin and you let those worms come in, then they have choice. They could be in the bin, they could be out, whichever. So that's, that's my take on it. Okay, I, those are all the questions. Thank you so much. Wow, yeah. oh, okay. <laughs> Unless anyone have any last questions that they're wanting to write now. Yeah, is yeah this is your chance, everybody. <laughs> but there's always the helpline. 
<laughs> yes, that is <laughs> In true. In case you come up with anything later, <laughs> you know, the helpline's a great resource. Yeah, and I do thank everybody for coming on today. It's it's we, as you could tell, really, really enjoy helping other people compost because we've had such joy in doing it ourselves and it it really does help the earth out. And we love all the questions. I mean, you know, it's so interesting for us to hear about other situations, um, you know, see things that we may not have seen before, think about things that we may not have thought about. So it's really, really nice to have um, to have all these questions from everyone. Yeah. Um, one last question. What is the helpline and can you explain what that is? <laughs> oh, someone asked that. Go ahead, Kelly. <laughs> sure. So the helpline is a, uh, a resource, a free resource for the public. Um, it's manned by master gardeners. So uh, if you have any questions on home horticulture, you know, integrated pest management, um, you know, home pests and things like that, you can contact the helpline, you can call in, you can email, or you can actually walk in. Um, some of the locations for the helpline will allow you to actually bring in samples of plants with problems or little pests that you might have captured. Um, and the the master gardeners who are at the helpline will do the research um you know on your questions or problems and get you you know the best answers that we can come up with so hopefully that's helpful and so we do have that slide uh, with all the helpline information that you'll get in your packet uh, oh and thank you can for also um, adding the link to our website in chat because you can get all the helpline information there also. Okay, well, thank Did you. Did I miss anything? I the <laughs> chat, I just Did included well. the link, the email and the phone number. Um, there is a slide with the helpline information there as well that will be on our website um, by end of day today. So check it out if you missed something today, but thank you to you both, Nancy and Kelly for another awesome vermicompost class. So. Um, thanks everybody for attending. Again, go to the community resources website and this class will be available to you all. Thanks everyone. Great. Thank you so Super. much, everyone. Yeah, thank you. Can. Thank you. <laughs>